Hi everyone and welcome to learn A-level biology for free with Miss Estrick. In this video I'm going to go through genetic fingerprinting which includes gel electrophoresis. So first of all the key concept to be aware of for genetic fingerprinting is that it is the examination of VNTRs. And VNTRs are variable number tandem repeats, which you find in the introns of human DNA. And about 95% or even more of your DNA are introns. And these are the non-coding regions of your DNA. And within those introns, you have these variable number tandem repeats, which means these long sequences of DNA bases that repeat over and over and over, but they don't code for anything. Now, the probability of two individuals having the same VNTRs is incredibly low. And the more closely related you are to someone, the more similar your VNTRs are. So it's these sections of DNA, the VNTRs, which are analysed in genetic fingerprinting to gain an idea of genetic relationships, um, but also the variation within a population. And we'll focus on some specific applications later on in this video. So one thing you need to know is the whole process of genetic fingerprinting. And it can be separated into these stages, which we'll go through. Collection and extraction, digestion, separation, hybridization, development, and then finally the analysis. So step one, you need to collect and extract your DNA sample. And even the smallest amount of DNA can be used in genetic fingerprinting. The places that you might be able to get DNA from could be blood. So if it was a crime scene, if there's any blood left at the scene, or if you are deliberately doing a genetic test, it could be a blood sample. Body cells, so any other body cells that might be found at a crime scene, hair follicles, for example, or if you are going for a paternity test, it could be a cheek swab. So just looking at the DNA in your cheek cells. So if you do only have a very, very small sample of DNA, what would then happen is that DNA would be cloned via PCR. And that way you then end up getting a very, very large sample of that DNA. And if you don't know about PCR, if you just click here, you can see my video on PCR. So now we've got a larger sample of the DNA that we want to examine. We need to digest it to cut it up into all of the different VNTRs within that person or animals or plants um, sample of DNA. And to do this, we use restriction endonucleases. And these are enzymes which can cut DNA. And because it's an enzyme, you deliberately select restriction endonucleases whose active site is complementary in shape to the sequence just before the VNTRs. And in that way, it will cut the DNA just before the VNTRs and just after, and therefore you will have your entire length of the VNTR maintained. Now we've got all of the VNTRs cut up, we need to separate them out so we can analyze which VNTRs this individual has. And this is where the gel electrophoresis stage comes in. So what you would do is the sample of DNA, you would pipette into these tiny wells inside of agar gel. And if you are comparing multiple individuals DNA, then that is what would go in each of these wells. But one individual's DNA just goes into one well. The next thing is, you can see in this image, there is a liquid there, and there is a buffer liquid that is poured over the top of the gel. And then electrical voltage is applied. So at one end of the gel, the end nearest the DNA, there's a negative charge. The end that is far away from the wells where you've just petted in the DNA has a positive charge. And because DNA is negatively charged, the DNA samples that have been pipetted into these wells will start to move through the agar towards the other end. Now, if you're wondering why DNA is negatively charged, if you just have a look here on this diagram, 
The phosphate group on DNA, you can see on those oxygens, um, they are negative. So it is the phosphate group that gives DNA its negative charge. So the next step within this gel electrophoresis, as I said, you apply this electrical voltage and the DNA, because it's negative, will move towards the positive end. But the gel that it's moving through does create some resistance. So it is quite challenging for the DNA to move through that gel. And the smaller pieces of DNA, so the smaller length VNTRs, are therefore able to move faster. And that means they'll move further along the gel compared to much bigger or longer VNTRs. It's harder for them to move, so they won't be moving as far through the gel. And in that way, all of the different lengths of VNTRs within the sample are separated out. Final step within this separation is an alkaline is added to the gel. And that is so that all of these VNTRs, the pieces of DNA that are in this position, at the moment, they are double stranded. We add an alkaline to make them all single stranded because that is what is needed for the next step in development and hybridization. So hybridization, what this means is you're adding a different piece of DNA to the DNA that is in your gel. So you've got a hybrid piece of DNA. And this is why we had to make our DNA single stranded. And what we'll be adding to bind to those single strands of the VNTRs on the gel are what we call DNA probes. And you could be asked for one mark, what is a DNA probe? So they're short pieces of DNA, they're single stranded, they are designed to be complementary in base sequence to whatever you want them to bind to. In this case, it's the VNTRs. And the final key point is they're always labelled. And that is normally with either a radioactive chemical or a fluorescent chemical. So what we then do is we add lots of different DNA probes to our gel. And those which are complementary in base sequence to the VNTRs will bind to the VNTRs. So we mix those all together, then we rinse our gel to make sure any DNA probes that didn't bind are washed away. So then we get to the development stage. And what this means is how we actually visualize the position of those VNTRs. Now, before we do that, we do have to actually transfer the DNA with those attached DNA probes onto a nylon sheet. And the reason for this is the agar gel, once it's taken out of the liquid, it does start to dry out and that will cause it to shrink and crack. So you won't get a very clear image. So we transfer it to the nylon sheet so it will last longer. Now that nylon sheet, there's two different ways you can develop the image. And that depends on the type of label that was used on the DNA probe. So if it was a radioactive gene probe, you would place your nylon sheet um, to be exposed to x-rays. And that would then give you these black and white bands. If you use fluorescence, then you can use UV light and that will make the DNA probes attached to the VNTRs glow a greeny yellow color. So those are the two options of how you develop your gel electrophoresis. So finally then is the analysis. Once you've gone through all of those stages, how can you actually then use this genetic fingerprinting to gain information? And I've put together here one that I did five years ago. And what you would look at is you always have a marker that is put in. And what that means is a DNA sample with VNTRs of known lengths is put into that first well. So therefore, all of these bands, you can then know exactly which VNTR that is. So then when you look at what you have, you can identify the size or the length of that particular VNTR that you are looking at. So what I was doing in this example was I was given an unknown um, sample of DNA and then there were five other pieces of DNA and I had to match up from my unknown sample which one of these five does it match. 
And what you do in your analysis is you compare the positions of the VNTR bands. So on our unknown, we can see we've got one very, very bright and quite thick band here, and then some smaller ones underneath. And that matches perfectly with number three. All of the others have additional bands and bands in other positions, which indicates they have different length VNTRs. So those two, number three, matches the unknown. And that could be used at a crime scene. So for example, the unknown sample could be the DNA that was found at the crime scene. And these are, could be your five suspects. And that would then not tell you that someone has committed a crime, but it would tell you that number three was at the crime scene. Another way this could be used is in paternity tests. Um, so in paternity tests, if you know the mother, and you have maybe in this example, we've got three men that we need to identify which one is the father of this child. The child's DNA will contain VNTRs that are from the mother and from the father. So any band in the child that doesn't match up to the mother must have come from the father. And in that way, you can identify which of these three men is this child's father. So for example, this yellow band here is not from the mother, so it has to be the father. So straight away, we can rule out number three. It must be either one or two. Then we get to this, these two bands here. Those are not found in the mother, so it must be from the father. And we can see number two only has one of those bands. Number one has both. So number one is that child's father. So some other uses of the genetic fingerprinting then. We've talked about forensic science to place suspects at crime scenes. We've talked about paternity testing, but there's three other uses which are really important as well. Number one is medical diagnosis. So what you can do is examine someone's DNA, their genetic fingerprint, to see do they have VNTRs in the positions which are expected or known to be in those positions of individuals who suffer from a particular genetic disease. The final option is animal and plant breeding programs. So in zoos, for example, if they're trying to breed endangered animals, what they would want to do is check that they are not too closely related genetically. So you would take the two animals that you're going to breed, look at their genetic fingerprint and make sure that their VNTRs are not too similar. And it'd be the same idea with plants to make sure that you're not breeding together closely related plants. And the reason that we have to do this is to make sure that you're reducing the risk of passing on genetic conditions, so harmful genetic conditions. So that is all you need to know for A-level on the genetic fingerprinting and gel electrophoresis. If you found it helpful, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe.